In today's video, I'll show you how to write functional tests in ASP.NET Core, and I'm going to explain how they are different from integration tests. I'll start by explaining what functional tests are so that you can understand what we are trying to achieve by writing functional tests. Unlike integration tests that verify that the components in your system work as expected, functional tests verify the actual behavior of your system. Another way to look at it is that functional tests test your system from the user's perspective. And in our case, because we are developing an API, functional tests would be calling the API endpoints and verifying that they return the expected results. The post endpoint here for creating a new user can return different types of HTTP responses. It returns a 200 OK response if the user is successfully created. Otherwise, it's going to return a problem details. Now, the problem details response is a custom response that I'm returning, but basically it contains the status code and some additional information describing what the particular error was. The endpoint itself actually creates a new create user command, which also has a respective validator, and it's responsible for validating the name and the email on this command. It also has a respective command handler that checks, among other things, that the specified email is unique because we can create two users with the same email. Now, if you were to test this particular use case together with a database, then you'd be talking about an integration test. But because we want to test our API endpoint and verify that we get back the expected status code, then we are talking about functional tests. So let's see how we're going to write our functional tests. I'm going to start by adding two NuGet packages to my testing project. Now the testing project is using XUnit to run our tests. It's also using Fluent Assertions to write the assert statements. And now I'm going to install the test containers library. It's going to allow me to spin up a container for my external services. And the one that I'm interested in is the PostgreSQL test containers library, which contains some utilities for working with a PostgreSQL database. I'm also going to install the MVC testing package. The exact name is Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC testing. This library allows us to spin up an in-memory application of our web API and run tests against this in-memory instance. The next thing I need to do is to add a custom web application factory. So I'm going to add a new folder inside of my functional tests unit test project and let's call it abstractions. And inside of it, I'm going to add a new class, which I will call the functional test web application factory. This class will implement the web application factory base class. And I'm going to specify the program file inside of my web API project. For this to be able to work in newer .NET versions, you have to make the program a public partial class so that it can be referenced from your custom web application factory. I'm also going to implement the iAsync lifetime interface. This is an interface exposed by my XUnit library, and it comes with two methods, initialize async and dispose async. I will have to say that this dispose async is a new method because a method with this name already exists on the web application factory that's implementing the iDisposable interface. So why are we creating our custom web application factory and what is it supposed to do? This class allows us to spin up an API instance that's going to reference this web API, which is the only one that we have. And it's also going to allow us to configure the services if you want to replace something for your tests. Now, this is important with external services, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to use this to provide a database instance for my tests. I'm going to use the test containers library to add a PostgreSQL container instance. So this will be a Docker container that I'm going to run during my unit tests. And this is where the iAsync lifetime interface comes in. I'm going to use it to start and stop my container instance. So I'm going to say database container, start async, and then in the dispose async method, we're going to be stopping the container. So I'll say db container stop async. I'm using the PostgreSQL builder, which is exposed by the test containers library to specify which image I want to use, what is the default database that I want to create, and I'm also specifying the username and password for additional security, although it's not required to actually be able to run your tests. Now, the next thing I want to do is to override the configure web host method. This method gives me access to the iWebHost builder, and this method in turn exposes the configure test services method. 
I can use it to modify my service collection. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to remove all services whose type is database context options, and I'm going to target my application write database context. What I did here is I removed the EF code registration for my database context instance. And now I have to add it again with a different connection string. So I'm going to say services, add db context, and I'm also going to specify my application write database context again. However, now I'm going to specify the specific options. So I want to be using PostgreSQL as I did before. However, I want to be using the connection string that is supplied by my test container instance. And this will change every time I run my tests. I want to make this practically identical with the original registration. So I'm also going to say use snake case naming convention. I also have one more database context in my application. So I'm going to do the same for that one. This is the read database context and I'm going to remove the original registration and add a new one pointing to the database running inside of a container. So this is my custom web application factory. And the next thing I need is a base class for my tests. So I'll create a base functional test class and I'm going to implement the I class fixture interface and specify my custom functional test web app factory. This is going to allow me to inject my factory as a service. And in turn, I can use the web app factory to create a service scope, resolve some scoped services, or get an HTTP client that is pointing to this API instance. So that's how I'm going to use it. I'm going to create a property that's going to return an HTTP client. And this is what we're going to use inside of our tests. So let's instantiate this inside of our constructor by saying factory create client. And we are ready to write our first functional test. So let's create a users folder where I'm going to group the test classes and I'm going to create a new class that I will call the create user tests. This class will inherit from my base functional test. It's going to need the constructor passing in the web application factory and I'm ready to write my first test. So I'm going to make this an asynchronous test. And what I want to verify is that my endpoint returns a 400 bad request when I specify an invalid email. Let's give this test a name. I'll call it should return bad request when email is missing. I'm going to split this into the arrange act and assert sections. In the arrange section, I want to create my request Type. This is an instance of the create user request class. So let's go ahead and create it. So create user request and I'm going to specify an empty email. Let's pass in something for the name and the Boolean flag. And now I can actually run my test. And this will just be using the HTTP client to call my API endpoint. I'm going to call my HTTP client and I'm interested in the post method. And what I'm going to use is the post as JSON async extension method. It's going to allow me to specify my route and then pass in the actual object. And it will take care of serializing this into JSON and sending it to our API instance. Of course, I should capture the HTTP response. So let's go ahead and create that. And now I want to verify that my response and for example, the status code is what I'm expecting. So let's say that this is the 400 bad request response. So if I run this test now, let's see if we get back a successful response. So I'm going to run this test. It's going to take a few moments because remember it's spinning up a Docker container in the background. However, it's going to now execute our test and you can see that the test completes. It would also be very helpful if I could write an assertion that's going to verify that the error that I got back is actually because of the missing email. So here's how you can do this. I'm going to deserialize the response of my HTTP message into a custom problem details type. So I'm going to show you what this is in just a moment. And how I'm going to get this is by invoking an extension method that I created, which is called get problem details. So let me show you what's going on here. The custom problem details type is basically the same as the built-in problem details, except I added a strongly typed errors collection so that I can verify what are the concrete errors that I'm returning from my API response. The extension method itself is only going to take the content of my HTTP response message 
and try to deserialize it into a custom problem details instance. I'm also making sure that the problem details is not null and I'm also throwing the exception if this is actually a successful response because something in the 200 range shouldn't have a problem details response in the first place. So if I go back to my test and now that I have my problem details instance, I need to somehow use it to verify my errors. So for example, I can say problem details errors and let's say that I want to select the error codes. So this will come from the error code property and then I can say should and I'll say contain. And then I need to specify what are the expected error codes. So let me specify them one by one. So I have the user error code static class, which contains the error codes for this use case. So what I'm expecting is the missing email error code and the invalid email error code. And this is how I can verify the contents of my problem details response. So if I run this test again, let's see if it's still passing. So you can see the test is still green and let me show you a few more tests that we can write. So I'm going to use the existing test as a template and I'm going to slightly change the test condition. So let's change this from a missing email to an invalid email. So let's just say that this is test. And in this case, I'm expecting this error code to not be there and only have the invalid email error code. I'm going to write one more test that my API endpoint is going to return a bad request when the name is missing. So let's specify that. I have to update my request object to have a valid email and a missing name. And I also have to adjust my test assertion to check for the missing name error code. So let me run the three test cases that I have now that are all checking for the validity of the user input. So you can see our tests completed and all of them are green. Now I want to write a test that's going to actually succeed. So I'm going to rename this to should return okay when the request is valid. And to actually get a valid request, I'm just going to specify a valid email and a valid name and I can check that the response that I get back is a 200 okay response. I can also check that I get back a proper response. I can do that by saying response content read from JSON async and this response only returns the identifier of the newly created user. So this will be a GUID. So let's call it user ID and I can write an assertion that should say that the user ID should not be empty. So let's run our test for the happy path and let's see if it succeeds. And you can see that the test is going to pass. So this functional test verifies that when I'm called this API endpoint with a proper request, I can create a user and persist it in the database and return the newly created user's identifier. Now, if I show you the create user command handler, you can see that I have this check here that is making sure that the email isn't already taken. So how would I write a functional test to verify that this is working as expected? Well, here's how that would look like. I'm going to create another test. And in this case, I'm expecting my API to return a conflict response when the user already exists. What I'm going to do here is to execute my API endpoint in the arrange step, and this one will actually succeed and manage to create a new user. So I'm also going to update the email to make sure that it's unique for this particular test. And I'm going to update my assert statement to check that I'm getting back a 409 conflict response in this case when I'm trying to create a duplicate user. So if I run this new test, let's see what's going to happen. You can see that the test passes and the API is correctly returning a 409 conflict response when I'm trying to create a new user with an email that is already taken. I think this is enough for the post endpoint. Let me show you how to write tests for our get endpoint that we can use to fetch the user by the identifier. So I'm going to implement the base functional test class. I'm going to add my constructor and we are ready to write our first test. In the first test, I want to check that my API endpoint should return not found when the user does not exist. So let's start by writing the arrange act and assert steps. In the arrange step, all I want to do is to obtain a user identifier. And this is just going to be a random GUID because I'm sure that a user with this identifier doesn't exist. In the act step, I'm going to grab my HTTP message response and I'm going to get it by calling HTTP client. Now the route that I'm going to hit will be 
API users user ID. Now you can see I'm getting some auto completion here. This is a resharper feature and I think it's really cool. And I can already generate the route that I want to hit. And now I need to assert that the HTTP response message contains the correct status code. So I'll say response status code should be not found. Let's run this test and see what's going to happen. You can see that our test is passing because a user with this identifier does not exist. So let me reuse this for the happy path test. It should return the okay response and the user when the user does exist. I'm going to add a helper method here that's going to take care of creating a new user and is going to return the newly created user's identifier. I'm going to call this method in my arrange step. So I'll call create user async to make sure that the user with this identifier exists and I'm going to update this to call get from JSON async. This method will deserialize my response into the one that I'm expecting. So now I can work with the user response directly. So I'm going to call this the user and in my assert statement, I'm going to just say that the user should not be null. If I go ahead and run this test, let's see what's going to happen. I'm expecting that the user will first be created. And if this step succeeds, we're going to try to fetch the user based on the newly created users identifier. So you can see that our test is indeed passing and the get from JSON async will also make sure that the response is a success response. Otherwise, it's going to throw an exception. If you want to learn more about writing integration tests using the test containers library, then take a look at this video next. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons and until next time, stay awesome.